yeah, let's just let's just get straight into it. I don't want people to be waiting too long. Um, welcome, guys, to the Pan African Traders Podcast. Um, on this podcast, we're going to be talking to different change makers in the whole African Pan African trade industry. Anything to do with trade, logistics, um, and African or people of African descent are involved. Um, we're going to cover the, those topics. So today um, we have a guest who is not really a guest. He's, uh, he's actually more of a, one of the admin for this for this group. Um, and we have Shalom. And, yeah, he's going to talk to us a little bit about, you know, what he's been doing, you know, his, his experience when it comes to exporting. Some of you already know who Shalom is. He's hosted a lot of rooms and given a lot of value. So um, without further ado, uh, Shalom, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today, brother? Doing well. Doing well. How are you? I'm doing, I'm doing great, doing great. Long day, but you know we got, we got to keep it going, you know. So, um, yeah. So I, I think the best place to start is just to get to know you a little bit for people in the room or people that listen to this podcast that haven't seen you or heard from you before. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself in terms of you know where you're from, um, you know where you grew up, just some general information, um, and then we can get down to business. All right, great. Yeah, absolutely. So, yes, I'm, I'm Shalom, one of the co-founders of the group. Um, I'm born and raised in Nigeria, uh, Northeast Nigeria. Born in Bochi. So, you know, my family's from the Northeast, and um, so was, really that's where I spent you know, a majority of my life. And I went to school in Plateau State. And so, you know, most of my life uh, since primary school has been Plateau State up. We're Plateau State and up north. So that's that's really most of my background. I went to school in Joss. So, like I said, ever, ever since I was in um, elementary or primary school, all the way to secondary school. You know, at some point in secondary school, then then I uh, moved out of the country. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. And just just whilst you're at it, um, do you do you speak Hausa? Oh, so say ma, how about? Yes, I could No, 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 that doesn't speak Hausa. Uh, yeah, nice, yeah nice. I do. Um, I do. Awesome, awesome. Um, so yes, for those of you that know myself and Shalom, we, we've actually met because we're both admins for this for the Agriculture in Africa group on Clubhouse, and we have spoken in the past, and uh, you know had a lot of conversations about working together, etc. And uh, something that came up during our conversations was the, was your past in in football. You know how you got involved in football when you were younger. Can you just tell us a, a brief bit about that, and then also how you take some of those principles and apply them to the business that you use today. Definitely. Um, so also if you're, if you're, if you're Nigerian, <laughs> you can't do without the reality that, uh, you love football. Um, so parts of the world call soccer, specifically the, the United States, but, so, you know, football has always been a part of my life. My dad was a football player, um, very passionate, talented football player. He played in Nigeria and university, all these things. And so I grew up around sports, different types of sports, not just football, you know, um, boxing, volleyball, table tennis, lawn tennis. So my dad's an athlete. And so I just kind of grew up, you know, how you, you just play football. It's not like it's anything super organized. But at some point, um, especially in secondary school, I went to, I went to boarding school. <laughs> I'm going to talk about that. It's a hot topic now, right? <laughs> I went to boarding school all my life. And so what do you do after school? You know, the guys play ball. That's what we do all the time. Now, I always played it for fun you, in the village, you know, we play with whatever we can at the time. Look, in boarding school, this is how much we needed a ball. We would take a rock, 
just pick any rock. And this is something I used to do when I was younger. So, so when you go to a birthday party, you know how parties are in Nigeria now. You go to birthday mm-hmm. parties, there's balloons, there's all these things. After every birthday party, I, I used to love going to birthday parties because, or any party, any celebration, weddings, all this stuff, and you pop the balloons, okay? After the event, when you pop the balloons, you take a rock, you find a rock that's somehow shaped, and then you start wrapping these balloons around the rock until it eventually forms a perfect ball. <laughs> okay? And that's how we used to get balls to play football. I'm serious. Anyways, that's how much we used to love football, and that's how much you play football. Um, so I was always into that. Being an athlete and, and music, I, I've just, I'm an active guy. So, anyways, as far as football goes, that's what it was to me. As I got a bit older, my dad, I used to just go, do, when I come back from school, I would, he plays every week. When I say my dad's an athlete, to this day, my dad's still an athlete. So, he goes out to play football every week. So when I come back from school, I go with him. And I used to, I, so I started playing with, you know, his his team. He had this team in Abuja that he played with. And so I would go to their practices, I would play. So I started playing with men older than me. Um, and, and I didn't really think much of it. But right before, not long before I left Nigeria, as I got more into my teenage years, you know, um, in Abuja, that's where the national team used to train, all these things. So there was this, this I guess it, at the time it was very new, the concept of youth development in professional sports, okay, in Nigeria. And so because I used to go out and, and play with this, uh, my, my dad's friends, etc., cetera, um, they started trying to put together things for it youth right so as i come back from school you know they'll put together a bunch of youth and we'll play that kind of thing like development and stuff but then i left so eventually when i left for for, for the united states in the united states is different you go to high schools and they have teams and when i say they have teams they have teams with jerseys you play other teams other schools it's well organized there's a season all of that and so that was my first experience around real organized football and so like you said i went to the united states in my teens when i was about 14 and so i started playing in high school secondary school for the teams out there in the united states for my high school team that i went to because it was uh, later in secondary school Anyways, long story short, that evolved into certain universities reaching out um, and wanting me to play there. And that's when I started learning about the U.S. system and how you can use sports, how sports is used as a means to get to university and college. Um, and so anyways, that's how I eventually picking a university to go to picked one local because I love the weather in California and um, I didn't want to be far from, uh, you know, the, the family that I did have <laughs> in America. So anyways, I played in college and at some point I decided that I wanted to become a professional. And so I began to plan that. Um, practice development for years and i would research any professional team in america that had tryouts you know trials anything and so i would research them i research different leagues in america because it's not just major league soccer there's different leagues so i did all this research found teams reached out to teams uh, I would find open trials, and these are you have to. Some of them you have to pay to play. So some of them are just open, meaning these open trials. Though announce it, you can go to any team's website, right? You can go, let's say, Man U, or let's pick a U.S.
best team. For example, you know, you pick a team, Los Angeles Galaxy, uh, uh, Houston, whoever. At the end of the season, typically closer to the beginning of the season, they will have these trials, open trials. So I would go to them, and that's how I started doing it. That's how I started playing, and um, eventually I got to the Los Angeles Galaxy. First, I went to Chicago, and that trial, I mean, it's like 500 plus people. <laughs> Sometimes you have a thousand people that show up to these things. It's, it's just <laughs> open. So you play these games. After the games, they have everybody has a number, and if they call your number, you stay. If they don't, you go. And so that's how I made it to, to the pros. And then, you know, that, that was in my university days. My, my, my mother didn't want me to leave university to go play. Uh, at teams in other countries, opportunities like that. But that's how I started. I just started doing open trials. And, and then eventually I played with the Los Angeles Galaxy play with many other teams and um and they eventually did a little bit of co uh, coaching but yeah that's that's really how i started my professional football career um but it was i was much younger i started really young so you're talking about you know 16 17 18 um that young this is this is awesome this is awesome it sounds like uh yeah, this this part this part of you is actually a very big part of you in terms of what you know part of who you become and how you got to where you are today. So um, I guess that kind of leads on to the second part of the question, which is how what kind of principles did you learn, or how did those principles kind of apply to what you're doing today, or do you implement any of those principles that you learned from playing as a team, etc.? Hundred percent. Let me tell you something. Every, every experience that you have in life, right, affects, you know, everything you do. And I took from principles that I learned in boarding school. Since we're talking, you know, obviously we all know what, what's happening in Nigeria and what happened in the boarding school. And, you know, you know rest in peace to Sylvester. That, that is sad. You know, that is a horrific experience. No, no parent should go through that. Um, but I went to boarding school all my life. Uh, I mean, <laughs> from the time I was six years old, you know, uh, for a very long time. So it's, it's been a shaping form of my life. Now, I would say the principles that helped me become a professional football player and, and stick to that were the principles that I initially got from not just my home, but also from boarding school, the discipline. Um, People really don't, well, I mean, if you're not in professional sports, then there's a lot of discipline that goes into it. But some of those things, and a lot of it, the core of it, I got from boarding school, you know, from, from, from that. So football, yes, there's a lot of principles that I took. And when I started at that young, I started realizing, because it was a decision I made, like, okay, I want to do this. Now, you have to understand that a lot of people didn't believe I would or could do it. I'm talking about coaches, teammates. <clears throat> right? If I start to tell you some of the things that people said at that time, it's like people didn't believe. But the, some of the principles, the discipline, the dedication, discernment, passion, purpose, persistence, and I mentioned these things. There's three P's and three D's. Discipline, dedication, discernment. I'll break them down. And passion, purpose, and persistence. Now, I, I put this together. These, these were the foundational pillars for me. And I wrote them down, and I started in 2010. I started, um, I, I pretty much wrote it down, and... My slogan was dreams and ambition, passion, purpose, persistence, discipline, dedication, discernment, because these were what I believe were some of the foundational principles that helped me become the first thing that I set out to be, which was, oh, professional football, how we get there. And then I started applying it in 2010 once I decided 
I want to do business full time. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And so my first company was called Dreams and Ambition. And these were our core principles. Um, and it was supposed to be a marketing and distribution company, but I had this, this was what was driving me. I had just come from a professional sports world going into business and I was going to use the same foundational principles to drive my business. And that, that was the beginning of business in Nigeria for me. I left that professional world and people call me crazy. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure some people listening perhaps do who say, why would you leave professional football to, to do business in Nigeria? But, um, yeah, I, so I, I 100% believe that these principles, I still apply them today. Every day, I still apply them. Um, there's still things I do today that I got from boarding school. You know, this is, this is interesting because I don't, I don't know why it, it got me when you said, um, you know, about people didn't really understand because uh, when I first decided to leave my job in the UK and, and chase this agribusiness dream um, in Nigeria, people didn't understand. Even family didn't understand, you know. Yeah. Stuff, oh, you know, he's gone, he's gone to Nigeria to become a farmer. You know, he's left his, his good job, blah, blah, blah. So I, I completely um, can really feel where you're coming from when you say that. Like, even the closest people to you, it's not just friends, but like family it will be just kind of, not, they wouldn't understand, really. And so um, uh, I, I completely see, you know, where you're coming from with that. But um, that's, a, that's a great story. And also, I think it's really important for people to get that background because, you know, uh, with business, sometimes you can learn, like, Okay, I have to do A, B, C, D. You know, people are here. Maybe they want to learn how to export hibiscus and all these things. But you know, if you don't have a lot of these inner qualities, or if you don't have this mental toughness, or this dedication and discipline and persistence and passion, and these things you mentioned, you know, you're dead on arrival. Really, you're not really going to get to where you need to go to. So it's not just about knowing the step-by-step -step process of exporting hibiscus. It's also about the soft skills. The the qualities that you need to be able to push through when things go wrong, to be able to wake up like you are, you know, early in the morning in different time zones and working late hours. Like, these are the things that people really need to hear um, to, to, to get them prepared for the information we're going to share further down the line. So thanks for, um, you know, getting, giving us that background. So I guess the next question is, you know, how, how exactly did you get into this uh, export business, or did you start off with, you know, being an aggregator? How did you, you know, make this shift from, you know, your digital marketing or your marketing agency into becoming a hibiscus exporter? Yeah, great question. So, look, a lot of things I do <laughs> I have to credit um, my father. You know. Um, is it, I mean, that's, the, that's where I've learned a lot of things from, life, skills, different things. But uh, I credit it to my father, and I also credit it to my upbringing. See, my upbringing in northern Nigeria. Um, as many people do in the north, we, we come from farming families. And so... I'd always been in agriculture. Yeah, my father farmed to get money to pay for school. That's I guess how that's how you make a living, right? Agriculture, and that's how it was, especially back in those times, uh, and still today. <laughs> and I'm not making ancient, but uh, so. Anyways, it's it started there. My, my father, when I was really young, I knew. I, I watch them travel to different countries, um, import things. So I was aware of that industry. Later on in life, um, he's always kind of been into it in terms of imports, not so much exports. Um, I take that back, imports and exports. But I had always seen the import side, so I always was aware of these things. Um, Early on in the early days of Abuja, you know, uh, Julius Berger, you would see their containers everywhere. It, 
so there was always some kind of understanding. I, I always saw all the stuff that was farmed, all the corn, all the maize put on trailers and saying, yeah, I knew they were going to different countries. So I had some awareness of it. And at some point, I started helping my father do his export business um, in terms of uh, he, he does more equipment, heavy equipment, vehicles, things like that, not so much agriculture. So anyways, that shaped some of it in terms of uh, uh, getting into this. But specifically how I got into hibiscus, well, that's a, that's a longer story. I guess that's what we're here for, right? Uh, so I'll back up a bit. At some point, like I said, I moved to the States in my teenage years, went to school there for a bit, went to university, played ball, etc. After I played ball, um, like I said, I started this marketing and distribution company to do international trade between Nigeria and U.S. Uh, I had reached out to some companies in, in the U.S. for distribution um, contracts, and I got, a, I got a few. And so I started in that business. It didn't go as planned, okay? Uh, so that was, that was the first thing I tried to do exports with. It was fashion. Um, I came from a background of marketing and between in my college years, at the same time that I was doing football, I was doing marketing. I was an intern. I was working for free <laughs> for years, for, I say years, for a couple of years, I was working for free for a company in Los Angeles just to do their marketing. I wanted to learn marketing. And I was in university. I understood certain things, but. I was always driven towards how do you market and sell things. So very early on, this is before we had Facebook groups and all these things. I was pushing, I'm talking about MySpace days. I would <laughs> go on MySpace. I found this company on MySpace. I loved their clothes, reached out to them on MySpace. The owner said I could be an intern. What do I want to do? <laughs> I want to do marketing. And this company is called 5-4, 5-4 Clothing. So I started with 5-4 Clothing. Uh, you can Google them. Now it's called 5-4 Group, and they have quite a number of lines. But I started with 5-4 Clothing very early on. They were still a startup. And so it gave me the opportunity to do different things in marketing. It was only two guys in marketing, me and another guy, um, and who was my boss. He was the director of marketing. So I did that, learned a lot of marketing. And I wanted to implement the distribution side. Now, how that got into my head was through doing this marketing, I learned about trade shows. So I would go to trade shows with them. And I just saw a whole different world. So I learned a lot from that experience. And so I decided I would, I knew I wanted to do international trade. I knew I wanted to do import export, but what was the product? I didn't know. So I started with what I could get and what I was passionate about at that time, which was fashion. And so I started um, doing this, you know, international export thing with the fashion. I lost a lot of money. I lost a lot of money. Um, it was a learning lesson. I went to Nigeria with all this stuff and I was bringing in clothes, but not a lot of stores were picking it up. So eventually I tried to sell it online at the time. Nobody's shopping online in Nigeria. <laughs> that was just the truth. That was, that was why I failed. Nobody was shopping online. And that was my whole business model. I was e-commerce. That's where I was focused because the stores, I wanted to do something different and unique. So long story short, that didn't work. And after some time, after that didn't work, I started taking some time to research what would actually work. Like, what can I actually export, whether from the U.S. to Nigeria or from Nigeria to U.S.? That was when I started looking at hibiscus. And the reason why was all around me, they drink Zobu. <laughs> In America, Mexicans drink Zobu more than Nigerians. The only thing I would say is Nigerians probably drink more in volume. 
perhaps due to sheer population, but it's not even the entire population that really drinks it like that. So all around in the U.S., they drink Zogo, and, and Mexicans drink a lot of Zogo. They call it Jamaica. They have a name for it. So so that was, that was initially how I started doing stuff. I started researching a lot. I started researching a lot. Um, I went to Mexico. I moved to Mexico for some time, um, just for a few months, and just immersed myself in understanding the culture, immersed myself in many things. So I did a lot of research, and then I decided hibiscus zobo because in the north, we farm a lot of it. <laughs> you know, we farm a lot of it. And so I have family everywhere in the north. In Jigawa, they formed so much of it. So I already knew that we had it. And when I just started doing more research, I discovered that, you know, this is where they actually get it. They export it from Nigeria, um, a lot of them. So that was how I got into it. You know, that's that's crazy because um, when, when I went on a West African trip uh, maybe a year or two ago, I visited a few countries like uh, Senegal and Gambia and stuff. And I realized they, they drink a lot of, um, you know, Zobo as well. And I was like, wait, 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 this this Zobo thing is actually across the entire West Africa. Exactly. And like, and like yourself as well, I Googled it, you know, Mexico, this thing. that I, And even, even like in the Caribbean, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And then I was so shocked to learn that Nigeria was one of the largest exporters of hibiscus. I, I had... I had no one told me this when I grew up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> we just hear about the oil and gas, but we never exactly. hear that, like there's people like moving stuff out. And who are these people that are moving it? I didn't even know because I I had never met anyone in my life that had exported hibiscus flour. Like you're probably one of the first people that I met doing that. So I mean, how was that revelation to you? Just figuring out that this so much hibiscus leaving Nigeria and you, and you didn't even know about it. Google, <laughs> like, bro, Google, look, research is not, yes, there's, there's on ground research I've done and I've gone out. I, I, I mean, I do a lot of research, <laughs> you know, um, I learned so much for my first lesson. <laughs> okay. In Port Expo business, you can lose a lot of money. Okay. Real quick. And it can, it can get depressing. I mean, we'll talk about it, but my experience is losing money and failing in business. I, I got depressed, man. <laughs> you know, it, it, this shit is not for the weak hearted. And I just did a lot of research. Google, you can do a lot of research using Google. There's a, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of tools out there. Um, I would find any company that was importing or exporting it and i would call them i don't whether i couldn't speak the language <laughs> that's how i learned a bit of spanish um i just did a lot of research and google was just it i didn't i didn't pay for it um i was broke i didn't pay for shit i was broke i was <laughs> i'm serious <laughs> i was so it was just google everybody has internet most people so I just I just Googled a lot, uh, found a lot of information, put things together, talked to people, went to events, just whatever I could. Um, so that, that's yeah. a lot of how I got and, the and information. Some of the stuff that you're saying here is, um, is making a lot of sense because I do get a lot of people that just like, you know, they expect you to just give all the answers to them. Like, oh, how do I do this? And then you just tell them everything. But they don't even bother to spend five minutes doing the research themselves. You know, some information that they could have just gone to Google. And it, when people just kind of ask me these kinds of questions, no offense to them, but it, it already gave me the sense that they're not going to put in that much effort so that this, the business might not succeed, succeed. Because if you're not willing to put in just like a few, like just some minutes every day or an hour or something, just to research the thing, and you just want the information to come to you, then are you really going to do well in the long run? And, well, um, and that's where, look, the reality too is that's that's where, that's where how you create services. People don't want to put in the work. Okay, it's a service. Pay for it. 
That's the way I see it. It's it's just that simple. Like research, that's now a service that our next year we're offering as if because this information, it's information. And yeah, some people don't have the time to do the research. So if you don't have the time, you gotta have the money. That no, that makes that makes a lot of sense actually. Um, and, and that is true because some people do have a nine to five, they have other things going on. So yeah, yeah you got you got you gotta pay to get that information. Yeah. So and that that makes a lot of sense. So when when you first started the hibiscus, right? Um, just on the top level, um, were you initially from your research, were you initially just looking to get into the US market or were you looking to get into the Mexican market? Because from what you're saying, it sounds like there's a huge consumption in Mexico. So which market were you focused on? Well, the Mexico market, that was, that was more of my focus at the start. Now, not because there wasn't a U.S. market. That was the first, that's the, you know, that was the first market I could see, right, and identify and I could see. Um, but when I really wanted to do it like exports, the, the biggest companies that were buying were in Mexico at that time. Now it's it's a bit different now. Things have changed, you know. Uh, obviously, if you do your research, you'll see. But things have changed in the business. But at the time, Mexico was the biggest market. But obviously, there's a language barrier, so you know, not a lot of people could get into it. And so that's, I, I took time, <laughs> learned Spanish. Um, you know, all, all these things and also learn their culture. And I'll say this, football helped me. And let me tell you how. When I, when I went to America as a teenager, I started going to day school. Imagine this. I've only gone to boarding school all my life. <laughs> okay. I've only gone to boarding school all my life. And then now I come into a new country and you go to school and come back every day. <laughs> it was okay. It took me some time to get used to it. Now, while I was in school, huge Mexican population, and this was my first time interacting with them. So, but we had something in common: immigrants. There was a lot of people that were immigrants. I'm an immigrant. They're immigrants. They love football. I love football. So that's how I even started getting into football. In in the I, in the secondary school I was in, in the high school, was because we played during lunchtime, and one of the Mexican guys was like, hey, why don't you come after school to, to try out with the team? And that's how I got into it. So I, I had been around of Mexican players, the best football players in America at that time were, were Mexican players, hands down. Hands down. And so... Most of my team was Mexican. <laughs> most of the people around me, all the teams I played, most of them were Mexican. So um, I got to really understand a lot about Mexicans, their culture, their food. You know, these these were things that I learned through my experiences in football because I was around them a lot. So that that helped as well. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, so I know there's other people in this room, but they might have been caught by different parts of, you know, the title, you know, the ginger, the share butter. So I just want to touch on each of them very briefly, just so you can kind of explain like, okay, I started with hibiscus and then I did ginger and then share. And these were the, you know, maybe nuances or differences between um, the different products. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Maybe talking about ginger and share and, you know, how you got into those and how they're different um, from from working with hype. Yeah, absolutely. So research, that's really what I'll say, you know, um, the same way I did with hibiscus, I spent some time, I did some research. Um, now, this was just preliminary research initially, where I was just paying attention. You know, what else can I export, import? That's really all I was doing. Now, I'll give some more. I have a lot of stories, but 
Um, we're talking about 10, 11, 12 years. <laughs> so I will have a lot of stories. Now, after I failed in the fashion thing and the e-commerce thing in Nigeria, in between that time and the point where I actually started exporting, there was a window of time where because my business failed exporting from the U.S. to Nigeria, okay, in the fashion thing, I lost a lot of money. I was broke. I had to do something. I have, <laughs> I have a family to feed, you know? And so I started developing my marketing agency because I knew I had a lot of marketing experience. So I started building out this marketing agency. I went back to doing, you know, I reached out to old people I'd worked with before in the fashion industry. I started doing consulting. I started doing, you know, uh, uh, offering marketing services to, to businesses, to companies, small businesses. And I did, at some point, I did so for my aunt who owned a hair salon. And it became very successful. We did really well. I started it with a couple of Canadian guys and we built it to become this agency that offered different services, full service for businesses. So this was things from events such as doing a trade show, right? You go to different cities, you set up a trade show, there's different things you need at a trade show, right? It's just a, what was your, what's another thing for exhibits or trade fair, right? You have a stand, you have a booth, you talk to people about your product, you print business cards, you have displays, all these kind of things. So anyways, I created that into a, into a business, offered it to companies, and that's how I started getting some of my startup capital for the exports. Because exports is, it takes a lot of money. It does. It's, it's a very expensive business. It takes a lot of money. So anyways, through doing that, doing the marketing for my aunt's business, <laughs> man, I just started seeing how much product move in the black community in America how much people spend. I mean, I started doing some marketing for her and within three to six months, we went from like making under 10 grand to 50 grand a month, <laughs> you know? And so a lot of stuff that was moving, health and beauty products, health and beauty products, and a lot of shea butter. <laughs> You know, a lot of hair and a lot of shade running. But so I, I started paying attention to the health and beauty thing. So I knew shea butter for sure. The ginger thing, ginger was always an experiment. Like I know that Nigeria, we, Kaduna has the best ginger. It does. Kaduna, look, they found the best ginger that you will find in the world. Okay. And I knew that we had that, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm born and raised in the North. So I knew we had that, but that was more of just like an experience. Let me see if I actually, actually, actually find the market. Shea butter, I already knew because of the experience I've had doing marketing for a hair salon, a hair business. So that, that's some of how that came about. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, uh, you heard it here, guys. Uh, Nigeria's got some of the best ginger in the world, and uh, we need we need to develop that market. To be honest, um, I know that the fresh ginger is very difficult because of our um, supply chain is not really that efficient. Um, so you know the dried ginger and the powdered ginger. I know uh, people do export that. So yeah, can you just touch on that really quickly? Um, what kind of ginger do you work with? You work with a dried, split one, the powdered ginger, the fresh ginger. Which which one do you work? With? Yeah, so, you know, I guess fast forward to where we are right now, it's it's our business and what we believe in is, you know, agriculture and agricultural development. So for years, just like we've done with oil um, in, in Nigeria, we've always exported oil, but it's never been in its refined form. It's always in its crude form, meaning 
it hasn't been refined in any way, right? And that's, if you want to get into the economy thing, that's why Nigeria is where it is now. Because especially when, once they remove the subsidy, I think people's eyes will open. Like, it's crazy. But the reality is we've always exported these raw materials. And that's what we've been. You know, uh, I'm not going to get too political, but the reality is Nigeria, as we know it, right, was created to extract raw materials. That's, that's what Nigeria is. So when you look at it fundamentally from that point of view, we export a lot of raw materials. Our, our vision and our mission is agricultural development. So that means not just raw materials, processing, manufacturing. That's where we're going. So with ginger, we've been focused on powder and oil. So we do ginger powder, we do ginger oil, and that's our core focus in terms of exports. That's that's amazing. That's amazing. Yo, that's a real value addition, and this is what I like to hear because uh, we need to get out of that you know loop of just exporting commodities and raw materials. You know, as as a as a country, as a continent, as a race of people, um, that's the only way that we can really start seeing growth. So I'm really really happy that you're doing that. Um, and so I guess that kind of leads on to something that you touched on very briefly. You know, your your company or your, what, what's your company? What's your company called? What are, what are you about? What's your, you know, what are you guys trying to do, basically? Yeah, I mean, thanks. So, Afrivana is the name of our company in Nigeria. We've primarily focused, like I said, on agricultural development. So, we're trying to enhance value chains. And that's why I speak a lot about it. We're trying to en enhance agricultural value chains in Nigeria. You know, and so... We've been focused on hibiscus for a long time, like I said, and I've given the background as to why there's a lot of history behind it. Even as a, as a kid in, in, in Bochi, um, I used to, I mean, this is how we farm it. Let's say my grandmother farms corn or something. We would farm the hibiscus around the farm, kind of like a fence. You know, so when, when they do flourish, she would take the flowers because we use the leaves and the flowers. The leaves we use for soup. Okay, and then the flower, we make the zubu. And she would make it, uh, my grandmother would make it and we would bag it and I would sell it. So I have a long history of selling zubu um, since I was a kid. And we focused on the hibiscus. We understand the market. Uh, in the U.S., or at least did, and we're extracting, well, I should say, exporting the raw materials initially. Um, but like I said, our vision is not just raw materials. It, it's really in manufacturing, processing and manufacturing. So um, then I started really intentionally uh, looking for manufacturers or businesses that I knew Used hibiscus in this manner, or a fine. I was at this. I was at this event in Abuja, um, and I did this presentation about my business. And there, there was another guy. It was more. It wasn't a competition, but you present, and there was an award, etc. But there was another gentleman that had presented uh, a peer of mine, youth of mine, and after he talked to me and told me there's this guy in the UK that used hibiscus and made these drinks. And so then he connected us. Um, and I think he's here too, Raphael, he's, he's somewhere there. But anyways, he connected us and it was this company, Calix Drinks. And they're out of the UK, but he's another Niger guy. So it was like, oh, I, I didn't know anybody at that time that was refining and processing hibiscus from Nigeria in that way. And so anyways, we connected and led to present day to this journey. But um, Rafael Calix Drinks, he does amazing things with, with hibiscus flowers. I mean, absolutely amazing. Oh, he, most of his drinks are made um, of hibiscus. He has hibiscus apple, which is wild. We have um, hibiscus grape, 
And so, anyways, we began to supply him. Sorry, Shalom, so, so I'm real quick. Yeah. Can you just spell Calyx for people that want to look Yeah, C-A-L-Y-X. You can Google it. Calyx Drinks. C-A-L-Y-X. Or you can go to calyxdrinks.co.uk. That's the website. And um, so, Rafael and I started... You know, I started sending him flowers. He was making these amazing drinks and doing amazing things with that. And that that clicked because that's the vision I see. You know, and when we talk about enhancing the value chain, for me, that's what that looks like. And the fact that it's another Nigerian or African with a similar vision, that, that was it for me. And so today, you know, we're still focused on enhancing the value chain, the agricultural value chain. Um, not just in Nigeria, but obviously that's where we started in terms of our headquarters, but we're also doing things in Ghana and Senegal, um, and eventually to East Africa, but that's what we do. So we pick certain products, we focus on them, we do a lot of research around them. Uh, we even have a research team now and we, we do a lot of stuff and our, our goal is just to there's a lot we can do with our raw materials, especially in agriculture. You know, there's a lot we can do, and that will create jobs. That will help us, you know, develop infrastructure and, and manufacturing. So that's what we need to be doing, and that's what we're focused on. Awesome, awesome. Um, I'm conscious that even, you know, your daily calls are going to start coming in at 9 a.m., so <laughs> Let's I want to just... Come. Yeah, exactly. So let's just, you know, for me, you know, I, funny enough, one of the biggest things that stuck with me from what you said today, uh, maybe it's because it, it, it's, um, I can relate to it personally, was when you said that, you know, your, your father was a, was a big inspiration in terms of a lot of what you learned. And, um, you know, one of my big takeaways from what you've, you know, shared today is just to listen, listen to your parents, you know. <laughs> something something so simple as just you know honoring your father and mother I, I, for me it's, um, sometimes it's those basic things because myself like you know when you're younger you want to do things your way you know you think you're smart you think you know everything um but once i started listening to my dad you know I, you know I've, I've i've seen so much more success so that's that's just one of my big takeaways but uh, just for you as well i mean for people that want to get into this industry in terms of exporting whether it be hibiscus, ginger, shea butter, um, what what kind of final words or words of advice would you want to leave people with if they want to learn something? Man, I'll touch on a couple of things. Um, one, I'll answer that, but I'll also say something about fathers. You know, like you said, fathers are a big inspiration, and that's that's the reality. No, no matter where, no matter how, if fathers are necessary. Um, but for a lot of people that want to get into this, I get I get asked this, as you know, um, quite often. And I think I've been trying to take a step back to kind of figure out oh, what's the best way I can actually, you know, help people that want to get into this. One, I'll say, taking time to, you know, like I said, this export business, import business, it can be, it's a, it's a financial obligation, you know, it, it's, it could be a financial, very heavy financial burden, you know, so make sure you understand what you're getting to, like actually take time to learn. And that's why I always say, you know, um, I have been suggesting and referring to things like when people go to school to become a doctor or a lawyer or a nurse or, you know, you take time and learn certain skills. Exports is the same, you know, um, way. I've, I've learned a lot from experience and learned from my father and learn from other things like that, but there's actually resources out there that you can you can go to school and learn this stuff. You can take courses. You can um, there's even 
is this Institute of Export Operations Management in Nigeria for people that want to know that. But now there's a lot of resources out there. I would say learn as much as you can. Uh, I also think it's good to, in some ways, quote unquote, intern, you know, go, go learn from somebody, you know, um, most of the questions I do get about it are people that, you know, just want to jump into it now and immediately because people hear about the, you can make a lot of money in it, but they don't hear about, you can lose a lot of money. That's the reality. Yes, you can make a lot of money, but you can lose a lot of money too. So that's the way it goes. There's risk. And so to, to de-risk as much as possible, look, learn from somebody. Go go learn, go intern somewhere, work for an export company. Um, take some time to learn it. But there's different aspects of exports too that you can be a part of. You know, there's so many different aspects of exports. So at least you can learn, start learning through one part, whether through a job or internship, and it'll open up your mind of understanding other aspects of the export business, you know, um, and, and products, like different things. There's different things to it. People export so tons of things. So it, it, could, it could be a lot of things. And different products can have different implications. So it can still be exports. Exporting electronics is different from exporting agricultural goods. Exporting raw materials is different from exporting finished goods. So there's different aspects to it and, and things that you can do. So for those that want to learn, I would say start there. It's, it's taking and learning as much as possible. Taking courses, taking classes, mentorship, actual hands-on on the job. For me, that's how I like to learn. So I know everybody's not the same, but I'm a hands-on kind of guy. You know, that's how I like to learn. That's fantastic. That's awesome. Um, so listen, uh, I know you've got a few minutes, so I just want to give people an opportunity to ask any questions. Um, so if you're in the clubhouse room, you want to put your hand up to go any questions, just go ahead and, uh, you know, just use this opportunity to, 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 to get some info. And if no one has any other questions, just that's fine as well. So I'll just give a, a minute for people to raise their hands. But in the meantime, I think in the, I just want to thank you, Shalom, for sharing that information. I think it's been super, super helpful. Um, and I think it's, it was really good that we touched on some of the soft skills because a lot of people just kind of take this business as like, oh, I just do this, this and that, and it works and fine. You know, you've got to have that resilience. Like you said, you know, you've lost money, you've had tough times, you've had to bounce back. So it's not just something that, not, everything just doesn't go rosy in business period, not even just an export thing, like in any kind of business. So you do need to have these kind of qualities and you've got to work on yourself as well as having that technical knowledge on, you know, exporting, etc. I will say, um, you know, myself, I have worked on, uh, created an export course. So if you want to reach out to me, send me a DM, um, I can send you a link to that course. Um, Shalom, do you have any um, courses or any materials you want to share with people that you might have you know, because of the number of requests I have been getting, I've been trying to create this course. Um, I have an exporter's guide, so I, I put everything in my link tree, and that's typically where I try to update whatever I have. So people can go to my link tree in my Instagram or I'll probably, probably on my LinkedIn as well, and you, you'll see information. There's, I have a whole exporter's guide. It's a free ebook there. As far as the course, the course isn't ready yet, but we're going to do a master class and do a course on it later on this month. They can find the information again on my link tree. There's a link there. And um, yeah, and there's a link to all my other stuff, YouTube, et cetera. But I'll be putting a lot of those tools as I create them or resources there. Um, and it also have links to blog, website, things like that. So, so fantastic. Yeah. We've literally ended right on time um, <laughs> we don't we don't have any questions so this is good uh we, we smashed it i'm sure we do so i know people are shy, people are shy you know people get shy, shy. <laughs> let's see 
you gotta bring them up. Let me let me, let me you, make I, you a mod. Let me make you a mod as well. So in case I'm getting some internet issues, because I know people got questions. People got questions, but the, you know when it's like there there aren't many people on stage and they might feel like, oh, is this a silly question, guys? This is, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Just like. Raise no, my, uh, Raphael's going to come up, and this is going to be fantastic because, you know, like I said, in this business, again, none of this happens alone. And I think we're in a, in a revolutionary time right now because there's so much information you can get, and there's people actually doing stuff, right? We're, we're actually doing stuff. Remember, we, offline, you know, it's not just... Hey, we're doing this on Clubhouse, but uh, Raphael, welcome. Hi. Hi, guys. Hey, can you hear me? You can hear you. Oh, amazing. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk, uh, Shalom and Malabi. Um, um, shout out to everybody here. Um, I'm, I'm really new to Clubhouse. Second time I've been on Clubhouse, I think. Um um, and you know everything Shalom said there is is on point. We've 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 been working together now for quite some time. Um, it's amazing. Um, we want to inspire a whole lot more people to um, to go out there and do what they what they believe in. Um, as Shalom said, it's 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 not uh, one of those things you just dabble into. You've got to do your research. You've got to be ready for it, and you've got to have that resilience for it. But um, the opportunity is is. It's, it's great if you get into it and you do it right and you do it well and you, you dedicate yourself to it. Um, yeah, it's it's one of those generational opportunities that you can bring not just for yourself but for people around you. And we're loving what we're doing. We've got a good partnership going. We want more people to join our partnership. Um, and and yeah, we're breaking boundaries every single day. Every single we talk every day and we break boundaries every day together. So yeah, I just thought I. You know, say something because uh, Shalom is giving me all the shout day. He, he's done amazing things in the states, um, acquiring a lot of new businesses, exporting uh, from Nigeria, exporting from the US, um, growing a team of people in marketing, people in production. Um, he's doing a whole lot more than he's talked about to you guys already. So don't don't underestimate uh, what he's been able to do in the in the states there, but. Um, um, we're all in this together, and the more people that are willing, able to join the team um, or division, um, the better. Yes, we've got a lot going on with Abiscus right now. We've got a lot going on with Ginger right now. We've got a lot going on with Share Butter right now. But, I mean, uh, Africa is the, is, is the motherland of, 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 of nature. We all know that. So the more people are identifying unique raw materials that the rest of the world need, um, the more we work together as a group of people, the better we're gonna we're gonna reap the benefits. Whether we reap it or our kids reap it or our gener the next generation reap it, uh, we we just pace setters right now. And uh, and I hope you guys listening will be able to um, to join. And it just doesn't go from Africa out; it goes the other way around as well. There's a lot of amazing things happening all over the world. Shalom is in the states, I'm in the UK, but yet yeah, we're doing a lot of things together. So there's no reason why. People from other parts of the world cannot join into this African revolution in or out of the continent. Thank you. Yep. Amazing. Yeah. And Raf, thank you. You know. Thanks. Um, but yeah, it's it's like you said. I mean, this is we, we live this. We yeah. live this every day. Yeah. This is this is really what we do, and uh, we have believed in our content for a long time. Again, it's not just like you said towards the end that it's it's not just as well us europe no look the continental opportunity is huge yeah, yeah. it's huge yeah, yeah we, we just chose to jump in there quickly shall we? we just we just started a new relationship with a group of people in south africa um they love what we're doing they love the hibiscus that uh, we're bringing in from from nigeria through shalom um, and they want to be a part of it. So we, we're already in final stages of some, some a variety of products. Uh, CBD is another part that is really growing in the international market right now. Just today alone, we've had two companies that have approached us to bottle it for them. Um, it's big in South Africa right now. It's big in the UK, obviously. It's massive in the US. Um, of course, the Nigerian government still sees it very differently, but 
you know, we hope one day they'll catch up to it as well. But the, the rest of the world is moving fast in, in green green plants, you know, antioxidants, phytonutrients, vitamins, things like that. It, it's it's all on the revolution right now. And, you know, everybody, whether in Nigeria or out of Nigeria or in the continent or out of the continent, need to latch on now. Um, or else you guys, you know, just be following, following, following the pieces later. Uh, what, what I also like is that you know is, is the partnership you know because if we if we work together we can get much further so I, I like that you guys have partnered up um, you know both of you are a, a young gentleman <laughs> I don't know your ages but I can say that I can say that from your, you know, your voices so I, I you know we just need more of that you know this is what I like to see I think this next generation we're, we're way uh, you know we're really open to collaboration which is a really positive thing because then we can all grow together and we can create something big because this is how other people other communities do it you know they just they just partner mm. they work together and they don't try and be sneaky or go behind someone's back no nah, no nah, just work transparently work together get money together everyone's happy everyone feeds their family so uh, that's what i like to see i like to see these kind of partnerships and i'm glad that you know we're, we're going to talk some more offline so yeah <laughs> I know we have uh, Joseph in here. I'm sure he has a question. But let me say this real quick. You know, at the beginning of this, you had asked me, you know, you had started asking me how football shaped how I do business. And this is part of it. You see, even in football, like I mentioned to you, right, you, you have, when you have 500 plus people trying to play sometimes just for one position, one spot, you know, it's, it's fierce competition. How do you get to that top? How do you get to be that one? And some of the things I learned in professional football and in my journey getting there was the ability to play as a team player, as a team. It's a mentality. And so it's the same way I approach business. I see positions. I see a field. I, I'm not joking. Like I literally, that's what I look at on my screen sometimes it's, it's a field and there's players and positions our goal is this how do we get there sometimes you have to pass it to Raphael. sometimes you have to pass it to this other person sometimes you have to pass it here as long as you play your role well play your position well we'll win all right we'll, 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 all have, we'll all have the same goal so that's how i view it and that's how I also approach, you know, uh, my partnerships and my relationships. I see it that way, you know. And so, anyways, I just wanted to chime that in there before. Uh, no, no, that, no, that's well said. That's that's what I was trying to get out of you earlier. But I'm glad. I'm glad you said. <laughs> okay. Awesome, awesome. So um, I think Joseph is the next person. I might be lagging, but I think Joseph is the person I see on stage right now. So, uh, yeah. welcome to the stage, Joseph. Do you have any uh, questions, comments, anything? To uh, th thank you very much, Malobi, Shalom, and uh, Raphael. Um, it's been wonderful, and uh, uh, it's great to know uh, the great things you're doing, Shalom. That's wonderful. Um, I am a British Army veteran. Um, I live in London at the moment, but I'm born and bred originally from Ghana. I've got 10 acres. I mean, currently, I, I do... Uh, lead software development teams using agile ways of working. That's what I do uh, um, uh, at the moment. But I'm really seriously looking into farming. I'm very, very novice, yes. But I have about 10 acres of land and thinking about doing something. I mean, the way you are discussing hibiscus, it looks very, very exciting. Now, um, my question is, how do you research? I know you've mentioned research, research, which is excellent, but how do you research bias? You know, so for instance, for hibiscus, are there any pointers? Because if you can go online now and spend hours, but if you have some guidance, you can focus your search and then get uh, results, uh, quality results uh, uh, quicker. So that's, uh, that's uh, one question. And then the other one is, do you actually would, would you would you recommend that one grows the hibiscus or you buy from 
uh, the farmers and uh, repackage them and export. Um, yes, and then uh, probably the third one is, I'm sorry, is what, what advice would you have for somebody like myself, very, very novice, but excited and uh, enthusiastic about doing something uh, in the agri space? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hi, hi Joseph. So, what was the last question you asked? The third so, so the, the the third one is just a general advice. I know you've spoken largely. Okay. But uh, looking at gotcha. where I'm coming from, what advice would you have for me? Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, for starters, you, you like I said, thank you for for the question. You you had mentioned researching bias, right? Um, as far as research goes, um, like I said, I started using a lot of Google, uh, frankly. Um, I looked at a lot of trade data. Um, also, while I was in the U.S., I, I went out. I would, I would call companies. I would call stores. Um, cold calls. I still do this to this day. <laughs> It's not. It's not a lot. I still do this to this day. Uh, today's Wednesday. I'm not doing it today, but like yesterday, I still I still do it. Cold calls are research companies that buy it or use it, and I'll reach out to them. That's what. That's to be honest with you. That's frankly how I've been able to. And then there's other the referrals. Now I get more, a lot more referrals. So that's how it started, and that's. Really, the only way I know about researching buyers um, is the way I've done it. This is the way I've done it. I just research companies, stores, and I call them and, and have conversations. So that's that's as far as researching buyers. Now, if, leading to your next question about buying from the farmers versus actually farming yourself, and I guess this will tie into some of the researching buyers part, but you're based in the UK. Um, if you have the ability to farm, have you farmed on the ten, 10 acres before or 10 hectares? No, it's just a fresh land. It's a virgin land. What part of Ghana? It's, it's, it's in the eastern region, very near to Kofaridja, if you're not going to be right. Okay. I know, I, I, I know Kwabenya, Kokobite, mm. you know, um, I know, it that way, but um, you can farm. Now, Farming, we can do a whole other room on just the realities of farming and having a land and you being in the diaspora. Now, I know some of the challenges in Nigeria and I know some of the challenges in Ghana. Uh, these are two areas that I'm very familiar with, but on the farming side of it, unless you find a system and reliable people that will actually do this farming for you. If you have that, go ahead and farm. You know, uh, it doesn't have to just be hibiscus. Again, I'm sharing to you what I've done with hibiscus. And I'm sharing this to you too, because look, we're, we're so rich in terms of, you can't point out a West African country to me that is not wealthy. And I mean wealthy in resources. So research something. I don't know what sells in the UK. Look around you. You're in London. You, there's a great up. You can go to all your stores. You can go to Boots. You can go to John Lewis. You can go to all these places. There's several places you can go to and just research, pay attention. You know, what is selling? What What do you have in Ghana? What can you farm from Ghana that you think will come? I can tell you this. I know that fresh fruits leave every day from Ghana to the UK. Fresh fruits, pineapples, some of this stuff that you find in your store daily. I know that. So there's different things you can farm, and there's markets for so many things. You know, if you want to look at the exports, so um, sure you can find hibiscus, but again, I don't know what the weather is like. You see, even with agriculture, you have to the crop you pick has to correlate with the weather. In northern Nigeria, we have certain type of weather, and that's why certain crops grow the way they do. So I don't know some of the weather conditions around that area to say farm this or farm that, but farming is not a bad idea. It's just the management that can be helped. And I'm just telling you as someone who's experienced this, right? 
uh, and I've seen many, 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 many times. If you're in the diaspora, a lot of people, especially us Africans in the diaspora, yes, you may have land. Now, the question is how you use that land. Agriculture is a great way to use it, but they, they, you have to build a solid system of management. If not, we all know how the story goes. You get me? So buying, that's another strategy. Yes, you, you can buy from farmers, you can buy from suppliers if you if that's what you want to do. That's a whole another process. That's a whole position in the value chain. <laughs> okay, so that's a whole job and role. And so it's not something that just comes easy. Um, you, especially when we're talking about agriculture in Africa. So both are both are options. There is not I'm I'm not saying they're not. They're both options, but I'm also giving you the reality that they will take work. Either one, whatever you choose, it will take work. And uh, lastly, as far as general, as he is on the phone, but um, as far as general advice, man, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, oh, there he is, Joseph. So as far as general advice for a novice, I think that you're in an interesting position. And it's also why I talk to the African diaspora audience in a certain way. So for someone like yourself, yes, there are great opportunities, right? Great opportunities on our continent. But the reality is you're living in the UK, right? So if you're primarily domestically living in the UK, you have to identify where in the value chain you can actually make the most impact or jump into immediately. Um, it might not be on the farming side, but hey, you have land. Maybe I'm looking for land to build a warehouse in Ghana. You get what I'm saying? You can lease land to me, right? Um, so there's different ways that you can actually strategically get into some of these things. Um, there's also opportunities for you to perhaps import something into the UK and start that way. You, you, you get me? So there's different points you can play in learning the value chain before you get into certain parts. So that would be some advice I would give to you particularly is learn the value chain, identify kind of where you can play the most. You have people like myself who are invested on the continent and for Africans in diaspora, the ones that say they have land, like I actually, I actually go out to things. So if you actually have land and it's good for that land, people like me, our companies, we, we look for those type of opportunities, whether it's the lease land, whether it's the lease farms, whether it's to, we, we look for different things. So there are other ways that you as an African in the diaspora can, you know, take advantage. At the end of the day, you want to make money. <laughs> you get me? You, you want to make money. And if you want to make it in the agricultural business, there's different ways you can. It, it doesn't have to just be farming. Hopefully that was yeah. that was good advice. <laughs> oh, brilliant, Shalom! I'm very grateful. They're excellent. Um, I will. Yeah, what's it called? Uh, is it okay to touch base with you and then? Uh, Send me a message. Back channel. Yeah. Sure. sure. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Or on Instagram. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. And just to address Shalom's point, um, yeah, if, if you're if you're in the diaspora, um, for me personally, I, I would try not to get into farming if you're not going to be um, in in the country where the farming is being done. Because you, even me myself in Nigeria, I want to get into farming in the northern part of Nigeria, but even then, that's still risky because if you're not there and able to check things, it's it's very difficult. And then also, um, again, just saying, supporting what Shalom was saying is. You know, try and figure out what actually grows well in that particular land because, you know, even the soil type is important. So you can get a uh, specialist that can test the soil and tell you what kind of crops would actually grow well on that soil. So, you know, the, the actual land and the soil dictates what you should grow rather than you dictating what you want to grow on that soil, if that makes sense. So make sure that the exactly. hibiscus can actually produce a decent yield on that land. Um, so... Yeah, these are the kind of things you need to think about. But 
you know, like Shalom said, if you're in the diaspora, you can actually be on the importing side. You can, you know, source the goods on the, in, in Ghana, maybe come down for a holiday, find suppliers of different products, go back to the UK and then start finding buyers and just doing these calls and finding buyers of products. And then you can just be that middle person or broker or importer that brings the goods into the UK. So thanks for your question, Joseph. I hope um, Shalom has answered your question. Thank you so much, Malavi. Thank you. This is a great platform. Thanks so much. No worries, no worries. Uh, so we've got the next person is Adebayo. Welcome to the stage. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I was on the road as you spoke, uh, Malobi and Shalom. And um, for me, I've learned a great deal from the two of you, specifically, you know, saying stuff about agriculture. Yes, just like uh, Joseph rightly said, I'm also a novice. Um, with agriculture. However, I'm looking at um, different aspects in the value chain that I can, you know, start off with. And um, I heard a slogan somewhere, someone saying that farmers will farm and investors will make money. Um, so, so now the question really is, um, which part of the value chain would you say start as, you know, like us novices like us um, should start off from? Um, you know, so yeah, that, that's just one of the questions. And hopefully, as you explain, um, I should be able to pick one or two things going forward. Thank you, I yield, ma'am. Just, just to clarify for Shalom as well, um, where, where are you based? Are you based in Nigeria? Yeah, yeah, Nigeria? Lagos. Yeah, Lagos, Nigeria. Lagos. All right, Shalom, you can, you can uh, go next. Um, and just quickly, guys, I think Yaya will be the... Okay, TPS, you'll be the last person. We're going to have to do it really quickly because... Um, Shalom has got some meetings to get to. So, um, yeah, Shalom, you can quickly um, answer Debayo's question, then we'll have Yaya and then TP. Okay, so Debayo, your question had to do with kind of where a novice would start in the value chain, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, in some ways, I feel like that's relative, you know, because we all have different resources and experiences or resources around us, different areas of living. So you're in Lagos. Now, nothing leaves. <laughs> um, most of Nigeria's exports leaves through Lagos, right? Um, so you're in a very key part of, might I even say, it's not just, we're not even just talking about Nigerian export. We're talking about African, West African, historically, Lagos pre-Nigeria has been a port and destination of exports. Okay, so believe me, you have a lot of resources around you. Uh, and I don't know what skills or background you have, but I think some of those things should shape where you fall in or where you choose to jump in. You know, you can't have Somebody that's only been, somebody that's a software person, do a driving job, Papa. You get me. <laughs> so there's different, there's a, there's a certain skill set you have to have to deal with even driving to a Papa. <laughs> Let's be clear. You know, to even drive around Lagos. So um, I think to, to answer your, your question, I think it, de it depends on some of your skill set, but also depends on the product, <laughs> I guess, in some ways, you know, it, 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 it could be a few factors. I think that the low barriers of entry um, are oftentimes in the more of the service space. You know, there's a lot of companies that just service exporters. You know, there's different things exporters need, whether it's from certifications to bags to, I mean, there's so many ways. So I think since you're in Lagos, you can definitely research a lot of companies in Lagos um, that do exports, you know, um, big and small. And there's different ways that you can perhaps 
start figuring out you know how how to learn more where you can fit but there's so many there's so many areas <laughs> if you are closer to the farms i would say you know there's people whose entire job is just the relationships with the farmers you know so yeah go ahead ralph sorry sorry shalom i thought you finished there i was just gonna say can i just suggest um following up on what you just said there about um certification that's one big gap that we have in exportation from the continent and from nigeria in particular by shalom and myself i've been in a lot of meetings with people in governments people in businesses trying to find people that can help with certification for things like organic certification things around um fair trade certification a lot of different certification iso certifications we need companies in nigeria we need manufacturers farmers in nigeria to, to step up their certifications on a standard because for companies like ourselves myself I'm selling into big retailers like waitrose in the uk like winko in the us we need to be able to show that the source of, of our raw materials is certified and currently Nigeria in particular, Africa as a continent, we lack that. We seriously lack that. So if you're in this forum and you're thinking of somewhere to start in the export market, well, certification might be somewhere to start. Look at the certifications required, the ISOs. You can use BRC, ISO is acceptable, uh, organic certification, a variety of different certifications that you can look into that you'll be able to allow or help people that are exporting to be able to trade on a, on a bigger bigger international platform. It's a, it's a big, big problem that we have within the um, within the industry because of things like around traceability. You know, if a farmer farms today and he harvests yam or he harvests hibiscus or whatever it is that he harvests, we need to be able to have evidence or be able to show the traceability of where that product came from, who farmed that product or how it was farmed, whether pesticides were used, additives, whatever it is. We need to be able to trace it all the way to the day it was far, uh, the way it was planted and the day it was, uh, it was it was harvested. And currently, that is a big, big, a big, big gap that we have in that in that market. So, sorry, Shalom, I just thought I add that to. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for adding. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's valuable information for him as well. So, there you go. You you have it from two people that we, we, we do exports and important. So, there's there's a lot of opportunity. You're in Lagos. There's a lot of places you can start um, in, in terms of learning some of the export stuff. So hopefully that was helpful, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. Fantastic. Um, so conscious of time, we'll just be moving on to Yahya and then TPS. So Yahya, go. For yeah, good evening. My name is Yahya Abdullah Beki. I'm based in Kano, Nigeria. I'm a public servant. I actually do a little bit of buying and holding of um, agricultural products because of the proximity I have to the major markets that sell these items. And I have not been able to participate in any international movement. And I came to Clubhouse purposely for this purpose. Unfortunately, I have never had the opportunity to meet those who are in this area. And um, yeah, and I felt it is somebody pinged me into this room, and I felt I was in a better position to ask how I was going to participate in this thing. And most times, we go to the rural areas to get these things, maybe at a lesser price compared to when they are being hoarded and when they are needed are brought out. So I want to know how I could participate, even being employed in such words to any of your companies, Shalom. And then I'll be doing all the local runs up here in the north to get maybe things that I can assess for your company. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, welcome. You said you're in Kano, but? Yes, I'm in Kano. Okay, perfect. Well, um, we do have a team on ground in Kano, Jigao. Um, so just reach out to me. I think you already have. And um, we'll see. I think it's a good time. We're looking to grow next year. Um, and like I said, it, there's, there's, different, there's different positions and roles in, in this uh, value chain. And Yahya already plays a role. So... Anyways, yeah, yeah. Um, either 
when I come to Kano, or uh, yeah, I'll put you in touch with with someone in Kano um, from our team, and then let's see how we go from there. What 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 uh, products have you worked on? I've actually worked on sorghum, corn, some beans, then the biscuits. Those are the basic products. I've worked ginger. I was, I did some, but I left it in Abuja because it was close to Buari. So I left it there, and I asked my mother to just dispose them when it was season for them to be disposed. Which market do you go to, Dawaki or where? No, I don't go to Dawaki. I mostly what I do, I go to Makarfi, and then I go to do it for ginger, um, hibiscus. Mm. So, I mean, we'll, we'll talk some more. How we have our system is a bit different. You know, okay. we're not... We're not um, and I know what you're talking about. Is you have situations where it's an export company, <clears throat> and again, this is where a lot of foreigners play roles in the export business in Nigeria. So you have companies that do come in, and they need someone like yourself that they don't they don't want to go to Dagi or anywhere else or Megateri or anywhere, you know. Um, but as you can see, I, I know this place is done because I, I I go there. So the way we operate is a bit different than what your typical expo company, uh, in terms of the services you're talking about, what we do. It's different from theirs. So we're not just looking to go to market and just buy from market and export. That's that's not really what we do. But there is a lot of skills and value to what you do that I think we can apply to our business and we can train and develop as well, you know, to help us in our operations over there. So um yeah so you go where else do you go Katsina, kaduna these type of areas no i go to kaduna that's mccarthy okay kaduna then giwa Kafanchan, what? Kafanchan. Kafanchan. yes that was the time i tried my hands on ginger and when i bought them i took them to Buari abuja okay all right no problem we, yeah. we can talk offline um just send me a message. I'll put you in touch with somebody, and then uh, okay. we'll see what we can do. Thank you very much. No problem. Awesome, awesome, awesome. That's why I like to see you shoot your shot. <laughs> you never know what can come out of it. So uh, thank you, Yahya. Um, so the last person we'll have is TPS, and then we will round things up. So TPS, go ahead and ask your question. Well, um, good evening, all. I really don't have a question to ask. Um, it's um, uh, thank you very much, Malab, Malubi, and Shalom. I've learned a lot, especially each time I come on this um, on this stage, especially from Shalom. Thank you very much for this um, forum. Anytime I come on, with, uh, I come online, I think I add more and more to my experience. Um, I looked at what Adebayo said about startup. I wanted to really encourage him. I noticed that he's not online any longer, and then. Um, if I had known, I would have sent him a message. Also, uh, in terms of startup in, in, in agriculture, um, I think um, in Nigeria, we have to look at what we do, what we want, like what Shalop said, how do you want to participate? Me, when I started agriculture a couple of years back, I had no experience. So what I just did was to go for those crops that takes longer years, I just need to visit to the make a visit to the farm two or three times before I, I harvest. Then also, yeah, yeah. I, thank you very much. I was as if you as if God directed you to this forum. I was looking for somebody to assist me, especially I want to get into the ginger business uh, and, and see how I can move on with it. Um, I'm going. I've sent you a message in the back channel. Um, kindly respond, just add me up, and let's see how we can pick it up from there. Uh, that's all. I don't think I'll be just contribution. Thank you very much, you guys. Thank you very much uh, for your contributions. Um, Thank you, so, TPS. I know he comes in, you know, he comes into some of my rooms and... Uh, a regular, Thank you huh? for helping me. Nice, nice, nice. Dope, I see, um, look, there's one person, Shay. This is someone I see him, and I'm pointing out he he's someone that is coming to 
some other runs before. And like I said earlier, I, I talked to a lot of Africans in diaspora. Where can you start? And all these, all these things. Some of, and he's someone that you know has uh, has started that journey, and uh, I'm really proud of him. That's why I'm pointing that out. But uh, he's someone that started that journey, showing him how to start with hibiscus, doing distribution in the U.S. You know. So, anyways, those are some of the things that I'll be teaching and sharing some more on. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, just a quick um, shout out to the room. Uh, please follow the Agriculture in Africa Club if you just click the greenhouse at the top of the room. Um, we've also got a WhatsApp group. So back channel B, myself or Shalom, um, we'll send you the link to the WhatsApp group. Uh, we just you know share interesting stuff and when we have upcoming rooms, etc. Um, and but yeah, that's pretty much. It. I'm, I'm really I'm really happy with how um, the, the room turned out today. So. Thank you very much for everyone that was able to stay and listen to us. And uh, yeah, Shalom, any final words before we wrap things up? Hey, thank you. I, I enjoyed it as well. And, you know, hopefully it's valuable information, inspiring enough for, for, for us to, you know, we're, we're on a real mission here. And, you know, we truly have a vision for the continent and what we want to do as youth, like you pointed out, you know, we're young guys that, We've invested our time, our money, our efforts, and so we're supported. You know, a lot of times we see people supporting more of foreigner stuff, like support our stuff, you know. So, um, yeah, my part, parting words, you know, check out Afrivana, check out Calyx Drinks. Um, we're doing amazing things with the business. You know, uh, like Raphael pointed out, we're talking about different types of things. You know, and, and these are things that are actually being produced by Nigerian guys. <laughs> you understand? And so support us. You know, that could be in showing up and sharing. And, you know, it doesn't have to support is not all financial. But if you are in the diaspora, go out and buy our stuff. Go out and buy our products. Like, so next year we're going to be doing a lot more with marketing and pushing more of this stuff out and uh, let people know what stores and where they can buy stuff if it's product events that we do i talked about my marketing agency earlier our thing was panel and day parties we did panels and day parties and so we'll be doing more panels things where we can have more conversations and put it out there so more people have the information and can make better decisions that way but yeah um, you can always reach out to me on social media, whether it's YouTube, Instagram, um, Clubhouse, and you know, I try to I try to respond as much as I can. But um, you can always reach out. And as far as things that I have or I'm doing, my link tree often has all the information. Um, as you know, I document a lot of my stuff and and put it out there, so you can expect to see more of that. But yeah, just support and. Let's, 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 let's all be on the same team. Well, everybody can be on the same team, but, you know. We'll do, we'll do all we can. So thanks for having me, Malobi. Thanks for having me, and I, I look forward to doing more of this. Awesome. Next next podcast should be your Raphael. That's going to be a good one. Okay, okay. We got, uh, like, Raphael, you've been put on the spot. Now, I, I just so put him on the spot, and I make it happen. You can't back out now. <laughs> Nice, yeah. yeah, well done. You've done it again. <laughs> Let's do it. Next Wednesday. We got, we got Calix drinks next Wednesday, guys. <laughs> done. Just clear out your, clear out your calendar. Is that done, Raphael? Yeah. Don't worry. Let me put him on the spot. <laughs> Don't worry. It's happening. Don't okay. worry. He, has, he hasn't got a choice anymore. So, nah, but uh, thanks, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for turning up. And, um, yeah, we'll see you in the next uh, room. Hopefully, we're going to try and do this thing weekly. So, yeah, we'll see you guys next time. And if you want to join the WhatsApp group, send me a back channel. So, yeah, have a nice evening, guys. Add me on that WhatsApp group, bro. Oh, sorry, say that again? I so said you got to add me on that group. No, you, you are. The agri oh, you're not? Agriculture in Africa? No. WhatsApp? No. Okay, okay, then. Just, send just, me a just saying that, oh, if the, we, we want to we want to we want to start um, doing more business in Nigeria with finished products. So, if if people that are interested in um, 
in what I saw with Shalom, I thought we in our new collaborations and new activities that we're, that we're working on that we want to bring to the country uh, from 2022. Um, they should join the forum, and I'm sure we'll talk about that um, next, next time. Fantastic, fantastic. This is, this is exciting stuff. I'm definitely going to be chatting with you guys a bit more offline. So, uh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, guys, and uh, enjoy the rest of your, your day. Thank you, Malobi. Cheers. It's been fun, man. So I look forward to the future ones. Thank you. Cheers, cheers.